The Quarterly, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon. Lesson 6, Philippians 4, 10 through 23. Well supplied. At this point, we really do enter the final section of Paul's letter. And in the process, we come to one of the chief reasons for which Paul wrote this letter. He wanted to thank the Philippians for the generous gift they had sent him, by means of Epaphroditus, to support him while he was in a Roman jail. Verse 10. Ancient prisons were harsh places, with few amenities, and not even much food for the inmates. But those with resources could make their time more bearable in a variety of ways, for example by receiving food from the outside. Paul's situation was still likely very challenging while in prison. The reference to Paul cha Paul's chains in uh, chapter 1 verse 13 is unlikely to be metaphorical, even if he doesn't always seem to have been physically restrained during his confinement. But the provisions and other resources sent by the Philippians undoubtedly lifted his spirits, as well as meeting his physical needs. Paul doesn't come out and say, thank you for your gift directly, perhaps because he wants to be careful not to seem to be soliciting another gift from them. But his thankfulness to the Philippians is evident. He rejoiced greatly in the Lord, just like in verse 4, that they had found the opportunity to demonstrate their concern for him, and not for the first time, since he calls it renewing their concern, verse 10. It's not that Paul thought they were unconcerned when they weren't sending him gifts, rather they'd simply been waiting for the right time. Nor did Paul absolutely need the things they had provided for him. On the contrary, he'd learned to be content in whatever circumstances he found himself, verse 11. Indeed, in the book of Acts, he demonstrated that ability to be content in very trying circumstances on his first visit to Philippi, when he and Silas were first beaten by an angry mob and then thrown into jail. Acts 16, 23 to 24. At midnight, Paul and Silas were to be found singing hymns to God before an earthquake opened the doors of their prison. And even then they didn't try to escape, content to let God free them by more conventional means when the time was right. Acts 16, 25 to 28. Now most of us would readily confess the challenge of being content in difficult circumstances, when we have little or nothing, and we find ourselves dealing with unjustly inflicted suffering. And Paul certainly knew all about that. But strikingly, Paul tells the Philippians that he had learned how to be content when he had plenty as well. Verse 12. Having an abundance does not always make us content. Often our souls get caught up in seeking even more than we have. In some cases, we may feel guilty over our abundance, when others have so little, and as a result, we're not able to enjoy something God has given us as a good gift. Living with plenty here on earth, while maintaining a clear-sighted focus on our heavenly citizenship, is tremendously difficult. Yet through God's grace, Paul had learned how to enjoy abundance while it was there, without clinging to it as if it were his right. He had also learned how to endure hardship, like a good soldier. 2 Timothy 2.3 Remembering that the battle would soon be over, and he would inherit an eternal reward. Either way, in poverty or in riches, he could rejoice in the Lord, in whom his real treasure was to be found. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, is another of those verses that we easily rip out of its context and treat as if it were a timeless truth. Indeed, there is a universal truth in this verse, for if God is strengthening us, then we can certainly overcome in all circumstances. However, in context, Paul is primarily referring to his ability to endure a wide variety of physical circumstances with joy, because of God's empowering presence. Either way, the last part of the verse is essential. It is not that Paul thinks he has the power within himself to do anything he set his mind to do, if he just thinks sufficiently positive thoughts. Rather, through the strengthening power of Christ, Paul has the ability to do and endure all the things to which he has been called the good works that God prepared beforehand for us to walk in them, of which he speaks in Ephesians 2.10. Paul particularly appreciated the Philippians coming to his aid when he was in trouble, verse 14. Many people want to be your friend when everything is going well. Fewer want to share your burdens during difficult times. 
when Paul set out from Macedonia on the return leg of his second missionary journey in Acts 17.10, it appears that no other church offered him their financial support, except for Philippi alone. Philippians 4.15 While he was in Thessalonica, about a three-day journey from Philippi, they sent him aid on more than one occasion. Verse 16 Again, this might easily have sounded as if Paul was angling for another gift from them, but Paul assures the Philippians that this was not the case. Rather, he wanted to make sure that they received due credit for their kindness, both in terms of his thanksgiving and the Lord's blessings. Verse 17. Now that Paul had received their current gifts through Epaphroditus, he had his needs abundantly supplied. Verse 18. Though I suspect that what Paul regarded as being well supplied in prison might be regarded by most people as fairly slim pickings. Paul describes the Philippians' gift in the language of the Old Testament sacrifices. They were a fragrant offering, like the whole burnt offering whose aroma went up to God. Paul uses the same language to refer to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, which, like the burnt offering, had atoning significance. An acceptable sacrifice was a sacrifice that God would accept, as well as being the means by which the offerer might himself be accepted by God. In the same way, the Philippians' gifts to Paul were not only a blessing to him, but were pleasing to God. Verse 18. Since they had used their own resources to serve God's kingdom, Paul was confident that God's superabundant resources would be poured out to meet their needs. Of course, the riches of God's glory in Christ Jesus, verse 19, were most clearly demonstrated through Christ's sufferings. So it would be a mistake to take this as a promise that Christians can expect to have abundant wealth if we just give generously to God. Paul himself was writing this letter from a jail cell, after all. But Paul knew that his God has unlimited resources at his disposal and is more than able to meet all our needs, financial, psychological, material, and otherwise. This God truly deserves all the glory, forever and ever. Verse 20. Paul's final words to the Philippians are words of greeting and grace. He urges them to greet every saint in Christ Jesus, verse 21, which may suggest either that not all the believers in Philippi could gather to hear this letter read, or perhaps that the Philippians were to greet all those who were truly the saints in Christ Jesus, but not to welcome those who professed to be Christians, but lived their lives as enemies of the cross through their ungodly lifestyles. Remember chapter 3, verse 19 were not to allow false teachers to mingle in with true believers, lest they might lead God's people astray. Paul also passed on greetings from the brothers who were with him, verse 21, likely his traveling companions who remained by his side while he was imprisoned, and from all the saints, especially those of Caesar's household, verse 22, which denotes the members of the churches in Rome. Caesar's household is not the Roman emperor's immediate family, but the much larger staff who were in the imperial employment. Many of these may have been quite ordinary household slaves, although some of this group could have been quite influential. As is normal for Paul, he concludes his letter with a benediction, a good word from God. This is not merely a pious wish for God's people to receive his grace, but an authoritative declaration that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ does indeed rest upon his people. It's analogous to the priestly blessing of the Old Testament, whereby the Aaronic priesthood were commanded to pronounce the Lord's name over his people. Numbers 6, 22-27 Yet the name that rests upon God's New Testament people is not the Lord, Yahweh, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the Eternal Son, and true God over all creation. Verse 23. To that benediction, Paul adds his own affirmation, Amen, a Hebrew word which means, may it be so. And we may be sure that for all the saints who are in Christ Jesus, it is indeed so. Application questions. 1. Have you ever received an unexpected gift at a particular time of need in your life? What happened? 2. Why is it hard to have abundance in your life? 3. When in your life do you need to be reminded that you can do all things 
through Christ who strengthens you. 4. Have you ever thought about the regular benediction at the end of the Sunday service? Why is that part of the service so important? Thank you.